All right, so we're almost ready to rock. I think we're going to uh, give people just another minute or two. Um, so while we're waiting, I'm, I'm going to tell a story because um, it relates to this very thin room. So, um, and some people probably haven't heard it before. I don't think you guys have heard it. So in uh, 2008, I, I took a job after my first startup failed with this company called GoGrid, which was the second public cloud in um, the United States after Amazon Web Services. And uh, two weeks after I started, I found out that public speaking was actually part of my job description, <laughs> which I had never done before. And I had been volunteered to go sp uh, speak at SNIA. So I'm sweating bullets the whole time, right? And I'm like doing all the research and trying to understand how Steve Jobs presents. And you know, I got two weeks, I prepare, I build this whole deck. I show up there, I walk in the room, the room's about four times larger than this. <laughs> and I'm like, crap. <laughs> I didn't get any sleep the night before. I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. I get up on stage and you, the way they had it set up, you kind of came out like you're a rock star and all the lights are like the lights were like two, three times brighter than this. I couldn't see anything except I, the entire room was empty except for like five people. It could fit like 400 people in there, like five people in there. And so I was still <laughs> nervous though. So I went through the whole deck, I gave my presentation, and you know, the thing I focused on was content. I tried to make sure all the content was really interesting, how these data points from GoGrid. And uh, at the end, all five people asked me at least one question. And so that became my new bar. Like, I don't care how many people are in the audience. What I care is like, did I give you guys value and did I get high level of engagement? So, um, that's just my story. So the room's a little thin, but you know, I'll be I'll be very happy, and so will our panelists, I think, if you ask good questions and get engaged, because you know, we're just here to have a conversation and try to understand things, right? Nobody's got the answers, but in having a dialogue, we kind of together find out um, you know, and hopefully learn more about what we're trying to accomplish. Sounds good. Great. Yeah. All right, so um, we're gonna go. So your panel today, um, I'm moderating, I'm Randy Bias, and I hope that you know who I am. I find out that as OpenStack gets bigger and bigger, as a figure I become smaller and smaller within OpenStack. Um, I've been part of OpenStack since the very beginning. I founded a company called Cloud Scaling that I was the CEO of, which was sold to EMC last year. And at EMC, I am one of uh, a few people, including Josh, who um, tries to make EMC think differently. Um, so as you can see, I'm not the typical EMC executive. I have no colored shirt. This is how I tend to go to business meetings, even in Japan. Um, so, um, you know, that's, that's me. And then I'll let each of the folks introduce themselves. Amit? Thank you, Randy. Uh, myself, Amit Tank. I'm a senior principal cloud architect. Uh, I help uh, DirecTV with their uh, cloud initiatives, uh, lead teams for putting OpenStack in production and different uh, use cases around uh, cloud. Hello, I'm Lachlan Evenson. I'm the cloud platform team lead at Lithium Technologies. You may have seen the keynote yesterday where I, I demonstrated Croc Hunter. So uh, we're using containers in production on OpenStack at the moment. So uh, I'm user operator, bring that experience in the enterprise space. So uh, I'm Josh Bernstein. I joined EMC uh, in May from Apple where I was responsible for data center infrastructure for Siri. Um, so as part of uh, joining EMC, Randy and I are kind of uh, the tag team show, I guess, trying to um, steer the ship, if you will. Change the direction of the ship. There you go. So um, for those who haven't seen um, me moderating a panel before, I, I go to fairly great lengths to try to have a diversity of opinion. I do not pick people who are my friends. I do not pick people from vendors and strategic partners or even customers necessarily. What I want to see is some different viewpoints because if everybody on the panel says, oh yeah, I agree with the guy next to me, then we don't really learn anything, right? The, where we find things out is in the areas of disagreement. So I tried to carefully select a panel of somebody who is trying to understand what his container journey looks like. That's a myth. He doesn't, he's not using containers yet. He's just at the very beginning of understanding. And in trying to figure out containers, and you can talk about this more in a second, he's trying to figure out like, do I put them on OpenStack? Do I not put them on OpenStack? Then I picked Lockie, who's using containers on top of OpenStack in Harmony, and very happy with it. And then I picked Josh, who I work with, but he's got the very interesting story around, you know, one of the world's largest 
container deployments at, at Apple where they use absolutely no virtualization. So we have containers at scale with no virtualization at web scale. We have containers on top of OpenStack in production where there's a lot of learning happening. And then we have somebody at the beginning of their container journey. So that's kind of why I got these three folks in here. So we could kind of explore, you know, do, can, do containers have a future in OpenStack? Or do they work in harmony with it? Do they work against it? And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. All right, sounds, sounds good? Sounds right. So the place I wanted to start with was to have each of these folks kind of describe their container journey. Um, and let's start with Josh and then work this way. And just each of them are gonna sort of tell us in more detail um, what that journey was like and, and what are the lessons learned so far. Yeah, thank you. So um, we started at, uh, at, at Apple with, um, you know, one of the, one, a very, very large virtualized environment running VMware. And after about two years or so, we decided that it was just too operationally complex to run something with virtualization at that scale. And uh, in the meantime, there, were, there was another group kind of going down the OpenStack journey in parallel. Um, they spent about 18 months on their OpenStack deployment. And we were kind of at an inflection point, decided we had to do something different. And so when we took a look at what OpenStack had offered them and gave them, um, it was kind of just the same mousetrap, but different than what we had already built. And we were looking for something fundamentally different and really fundamentally simpler, right? At, at a certain scale, the complexity uh, of a virtualized environment makes operating at its scale very, very difficult. And so that's where we landed on Mesos and containers. Um, it drove a lot of complexity out of the environment. It gave us tremendous capability around scale. And um, you know, we, we were lucky enough to have gone through that journey very quickly, I think. And how big was that environment? It, it was, uh, when, I, when I left, it was in the 85,000 server range. Those are physical servers, so it was big. Great, thanks, Lucky. So our journey started about six months ago. So we'd been running OpenStack in production with VMs for about two years, but we really didn't feel like we'd actually uh, solve the problem for the developer getting their app out into the cloud environment. As Josh was saying, it still felt far too complex and when we took a look at how our developers were deploying their app, they would spend typically a month writing a microservice, so four sprints, and it would take three months to get that into a VM cloud environment stably. So we felt that was a failing and we felt we could do better than that as a team. And around that time we started looking at Docker and we went to DockerCon and we'd been keeping an eye on the, on the container kind of ecosystem. And what we found is, is con containers gave developers a really nice a uh, handoff point, a contract point where they could package up their app and hand it to the infrastructure. So we thought, you know, let's give that a, a try, but we wanted it to be developer-led. In the past, we'd actually tried to come up with this tooling and give it to development, but this time we said, with very little overhead, can you run with containers and we'll provide the inf infrastructure? So, you know, in one month we went from no containers to containers in production, basically on the demand of the uh, developers. And that three month lead time to get something out is now down to about 15 minutes on the first run. And we're down deploying, we've deployed 30 microservices on containers to production uh, in two months. So that journey has really made it a smoother transition. And you're doing that in a hybrid fashion, is, is that right? Yeah, so an another, another value prop for containers is that we found was you could develop them locally and there are immutable images um, and you could put that image, you had a common runtime, whether it was on AWS or on OpenStack. <coughs> so it kind of leveled the playing field where we could have, we could use two clouds as essentially two different AZs, right, and have the same app and that's what I demoed yesterday, running in two places. Great. Amit? Very interesting, Lockie and Josh, thank you. Uh, our, our journey is a little interesting. We, take a, we tend to take a contrarian view on, we have a cloud uh, infrastructure that's already in place, a legacy cloud, as well as uh, some OpenStack-based clouds in flight towards production. So the question that we asked was, why do we need containers? And that started our evaluation journey. Uh, are there any microservices-based uh, approach that we could take for new applications or taking existing applications and decomposing them and then using them on containers? If the answer to those questions would be a yes, then let's go ahead and actually uh, evaluate uh, containers more closely. And we did venture into that area. And so currently we don't have anything in production. We do have 
several uh, proof of concepts going on where we are evaluating uh, containers in uh, OpenStack, containers on VMs, containers on bare metal, looking at uh, different ways where you could possibly leverage uh, the best performance, like hardware native performance for uh, cases, use cases like NFV and stuff. Uh, and at, at the end of our journey, we'll probably hopefully have a more clearer picture on whether we could put uh, containers into production on 10 percentage of the workload footprint, 20 percent, 30 percent, and so, so forth. Okay, great. Um, so if you want to ask a question, you could raise your hand or if you could come up to the mic um, anytime as we're going along would be great. Um, and um, since you were saying that you're gonna, you you wanted, or that you are contrarian, I'll just give it to you for a second. <laughs> and, and by the way, I'm not necessarily gonna follow the script here. This just gives us a basic arc to talk through. And um, it seems like when people are getting into containers, they're still trying to understand: is it is it the same as virtualization? Is it different? Is it application packaging for the developers? Is it a lightweight form of VMs? I mean. You're very early in your journey doing the, the mm -hmm. exploration. I mean, do you have any kind of initial sense of like, is it one or the bo both or one or the other or both or what? Sure, great question. Uh, I think we tend to see it as a combination of configuration management and packaging put together nicely boxed up in one container uh, format. Uh, whether or not it's same as uh, virtualization, we don't tend to see it as the same as virtualization, like another replacement of virtualization platform, because really virtualization does give you nice level of uh, security isolation, resource isolation, and many of those battle-tested proven uh, uh, attributes that come with a KVM or say ESXi or some of the other hypervisors, which today doesn't come along with containers. So we don't see it as a another virtualization option. Instead, we see something add, as adds value or augments our virtualization uh, strategy. So Siri runs without any isolation between the containers and it's a free-for-all and, you know, to complete. I mean, not, not speaking specifically about Siri. I mean, containers fundamentally differ from virtualization in that the containers rely on the same underlying kernel. So that if you have workloads that need different OSs for whatever reason, then you have to virtualize, right? If you, can, if you can get all of your application instances to use the same kernel, then you've eliminated a, a, a layer of complexity in the system. I think there are still plenty of ways that you can guarantee security and abstraction in the same way that containers give it to you now, or uh, virtual machines give it to you now. Um, so I just, I, I mean, I think that there are, I think a lesson that we learned was, well, why do we need all these different kernels for all these different use cases? Well, because that's the way we've always done things and that's the way it's been validated and tested, right? right? right. Um, but really, like any, the kernel really doesn't matter, right? So you can pick one kernel, all your applications can leverage it, and what you gain from that decision is this removal of this layer of complexity, I think. And that's the fundamental difference. Do you need the same OS or not? Or, and really, not by OS, but I mean the same kernel. You can run the same kernel everywhere. Why wouldn't you do it? It makes hard, supporting hardware easier, eliminates complexity. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just simpler. Agreed. And would you say, so, sorry, I didn't mean to a quick uh, follow-up thought. So would you characterize your apps as mostly user, user space apps and not uh, apps which have user and kernel presence as, as being those kind of uh, target candidate apps? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, there are certainly certain applications that need a kernel space derivative, like mm -hmm. maybe a file system driver or some like an NFV uh, instance. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, that's a good characterization of it. Okay. I think, you know, when, when you actually have a look at how our infrastructure is utilized, and this isn't a main driver for us, but there's, we're running so many kernels and they're managing memory they don't own via hypervisors, right? So there's actually a tremendous amount of waste on your infrastructure by running all these kernels. And not only that, you take a look at kernels, it's something to patch, something to manage, something you need config management. You actually uh, can simplify, not only, not only from the performance standpoint. So the hypervisor is a piece of middleware, right? And it's essentially feigning all these resources. Right? It's doing if, hardware emulation. It's basically. doing hardware emu emulation. If you take that out of the way, you have direct access, right? And it's a two-rooted C group. That's all a container is. Um, so you're relying on a single kernel. That's not a, a specific driver for us today. It was actually getting apps out and time to market. But it's something that we're aware of as we look at the overall utilization of our cloud and how dense we can pack things long term. Containers actually are a lot more compelling when you look at it that way. Well, when I, when I first started using containers, it was free BSD jails, and I was using them 
to create isolation and to create better security for a web facing application. So I've always been a little bit bemused by, you know, position of VMware, part of the EMC Federation, um, that, you know, that the type one hyper hypervisors are somehow more secure. I, I like that wasn't necessarily my experience. I mean, they, they seem like they could both be equally secure, but it does seem like the tooling around container security and management is much less mature than than VMware. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, it's definitely less mature from a tooling perspective, and you could argue that a, a virtualized environment, at least with VMware, is more secure because if you broke out of your virtual machine, your attack surface is ESX, it's not Linux. So I think you know the, the security discussion is, if you get a bunch of reasonable security people in the room, you run around in circles about what is secure enough, and there's always somebody who's kind of unreasonable in the room that has some sort of philosophy or religion on it, and you're never gonna convince them. So, uh, I mean, I think that's the state of security. You're either, you either get it and you accept the uh, arguably slightly additional risks for greater operational efficiency, or you cripple yourself with all this ridiculous security nonsense. And I, and, and I, I trust that the com community will come to pass that the way containers are deployed are, is secure. The same way, you know, VMs had to go through that same process. So I'm kind of relying on the fact that that maturity will come with time and this will come to pass that, okay, yes, the world is at consensus that, is, that this is a secure way to do business. Yeah, uh, uh, great point. And I, I really resonate with uh, one of the points that Josh uh, just made, where the, the advantage the, that you gain by making it more efficient is uh, something that is definitely gonna be mo more worth it, uh, even if you have to manage the security aspects of it a little bit actively. So and let me just get this straight. So like over here, I wish I had a picture for this. So over here I've got, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, an infrastructure as a service layer that provisions me virtual machines, which have an operating system. Um, and then I have a configuration management system like Chef Puppet, Ansible Salt. And then I have my application that gets deployed on it. And then kind of over here, I have a management framework. And then over here, I've got sort of like containers with, a management framework kind of all the way down, almost like a, more like a vertically integrated silo. And it sounds like I've not only re removed some of the complexity around the type one hypervisor and managing multiple operating systems and kernels, but I've also removed a lot of the configuration management tools and I've got something where it's very easy for me and very, very fast for me to spin up and, and put a container out in production or scale it, si scale it sideways. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I think one then of the one. Why of the, would I care about OpenStack? I mean, why why not just go all Mesos? I I I think that's a good direction to go. I said it. There, I said it. Absolutely. So absolutely. So what what our developer one of our developers to quote him was uh, getting an app out with VMs is like a Rube Goldberg machine, right? Where you've got an incredibly complex set of things that have to go in order to automate something like a napkin. I don't know if you guys have seen the Rube Goldberg images, but yeah, you go through that kind of journey to get a VM and an application deployed, right, which is incredibly complex, and if any piece of that breaks, the net effect is the, de the application doesn't get deployed, right? So but when you, what, for us, having OpenStack there meant that we could leverage a platform that basically resourceified network compute and storage, and we could overlay container orchestration really quickly and get it out there in a month. If we didn't have something like OpenStack that gave us access to all these different pillars uh, that you need, network compute and storage, we wouldn't have been able to turn that around in a month for sure. Interesting take. So Randy, you made an interesting point and I want to speak to that. When you say uh, that you've gotten, uh, you, you taken out the configuration and some of the other aspects of it, uh, are you alluding to having moved uh, offloaded those things to an external entity which would then act as an orchestration layer? Or are you alluding to the fact that somehow you have turned your application into uh, either stat uh, stateless or stateful form where you no longer need any of that configuration at all? Um, well, it seems to me my experience has been so far that if you go to a developer and you say, hey, learn this chef or puppet thing versus you know package your stuff up in a container, it's sort of a no-brainer for them, which is less effort, right. right? I mean, I love Chef and Puppet. I built my very first startup around Puppet, but it, you know, they're complex. Right, yeah. 
So, no, that's a great perspective. Uh, and I remember one note uh, you made, which was very uh, insightful note, that reducing the surface area uh, for the developers. But does that mean that by reducing that surface area for your developer, you are, in, you are increasing the surface area for your ops guys or your IT guys so that now they have to worry about managing the containers itself and orchestration of containers itself? No, I, I don't think so, in fact. I think that... Um, I think that you know one of the lessons we went through is when we got rid of virtual machines, um, our the size of our our puppet repo decreased substantially. Right, the first thing you do when a developer spins up a VM is now they want you to like, oh, can you change the version of Java running in that thing? And so now you have all this you have all this bloat in your puppet environment, right? right. Yeah. And so if you can if you can just simplify that all down. Um, I think it puts less burden on the ops guys and certainly less burden on the developers, right? The developers focus on what are the runtime requirements that they want and, and certainly when you add a PaaS on top of that where they can be declarative about the versions and the container itself and the image itself is built automatically, like right. the burden is tremendously lifted off of both teams. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, some people would say that you can't really eliminate complexity out of an IT system. I've heard this argument before you can kind of just push it around. Um, some people would say, and I'm kind of more in this camp, that um, you can eliminate some of the complexity if you're willing to have some of the trade-offs. I mean, like one of the fundamental things Amazon taught us is like, hey, if you move some of the complexity into the application layer in terms of you know managing apps managing themselves and being resilient and scaling out, that like suddenly like all the stuff you have to do at the physical underlying infrastructure leg is way way simpler. And I'd argue that that's not an even trade-off. Like it like there's so much more. Complexity save at the infrastructure layer and cost that like it's like a no-brainer to push it into the app layer. And once the tooling's all there, then you know your average developer can use a PaaS or whatever, and it's very simple. I think though that there's also you know we we as an industry have put all of that. You know you look at running Oracle, right? We go to great lengths with our infrastructure to support HA Oracle, right? right? You have all these hardware things, you have all this multi-path fiber channel environment, right? right? Like the database or the application should be aware of its ability to replicate and do DR. That's really where that complexity belongs. Exactly. Because to do it correctly, it has to be in the application. We've just accepted for so long that, that we'll just we'll make this a hardware problem, right? I think that's the wrong place to solve that problem to begin with. Yeah, not only that, but once you do, you try they I see everybody treats it like a hammer and then they just go around trying to reuse that hammer right. for everything, even when the apps don't require that level of redundancy and resiliency. So I, I don't think I got my, my question answered though, right? I mean, does OpenStack matter? Can we just get rid of it, kick it to the curve, and go with Mesos? I don't think you want me to answer that question. I want you to I answer that question. In fact, Josh, please answer that question. I, <laughs> I mean, we're at OpenStack, right? So it's, I, I think that, um, look, I think that the reality is is that there are applications, there are environments that for whatever reason, people want a virtualization. They want that abstraction. They want to run multiple OSs. They want, want to run different kernels and so on and so forth. And so um, for those use cases, sure, I can't argue with that. But I think that there's a tremendous amount of complexity that's still in OpenStack that can be eliminated um, by looking at other options. And I see some of you are ready to like jump up on the stage and kill me, which is fine. Um, <laughs> but, but um, you know, I was, I was in a session earlier today where they talked about, um, you know, all of the holes and all of the problems in, uh, in the OpenStack APIs. And depending upon what plugin you were leveraging, you would get different semantics around calling the API. Like, how is that really, like, open and easy and modular? Like, it's just abstraction for the sake of abstraction. You know, it, it, and maybe at a small scale, I think at a small scale it works just fine. But at the data center scale, I, I think it's too complex. Like, Try, um, uh, you know, try, uh, try diagnosing, uh, uh, you know, this VM, you can't ping this VM, right? You have all this complexity in the network and then you want to layer like a network abstraction on top of it. How do you operate at that scale efficiently? I, I don't know. Well, I, I mean, to play devil's advocate a little bit, right? I mean, how much does DirecTV look like Siri? Siri is pretty much a single app, right? It's no, pretty easy I, I for you to make it I think that's a misnomer. I mean, we, it's, it's several apps. Right, it's several microservices. People just call it one, and so I get All a little right. flack for that. But, but um, you know, I mean, talk about your experience running, you know, running your OpenStack at scale. Yeah. So uh, for us specifically, we see you know a need for both still. So that keeps OpenStack and, and AWS 
very much alive and, and VM's very much alive for us. So, you know, they complement and, you know, it's about uh, using the right tool for the right job and what business problem are you trying to solve, right? There, there is still definitely a need for virtualization in some cases. Some apps just mentioned are not uh, container friendly. You can't just pick them up and put in a, in a container. Such as? Such as, let's say, uh, a database, uh, some database technologies. So, I mean, they were, they were built on the assumptions that the hardware, depending on the database, right? If it's, if it's Cassandra, Kafka, sure, right? But if it's, if it's MySQL, it wasn't built to go up and come down and reattach and go up and come down and have multiple and issue scale up and scale da down commands, right? It wasn't built like that. You know, maybe, maybe one day it'll be there. But for, for us right now, I guess the other thing to note is it's a journey, right? As you go through these things, you know, AWS is at Lambda. Um, are, are people really consuming Lambda? Lambda? Is this something that we're going towards? Are we, are we evolving from VMs up to containers up to application runtimes that are, that are borderless compute? I don't know, but you know, as, as we hand these things to developers, it's giving them little steps, right, to, to really consume different levels of, of abstraction and complexity. So, you know, for us it's still a journey and we still see a need for both. And that's why, you know, OpenStack is, is important in our environment. Mitt, you were saying that you were trying to evaluate which apps could go in containers and, and, yeah. and, and which don't. Like, would you, are you mostly homogenous or have you got a heterogeneous set of operating systems? And I mean, how do you figure out what apps make sense? No, we definitely have a heterogeneous uh, environment. And I, I am leaning towards uh, Lockley's uh, position on this that uh, there are certain things like uh, Fusion middleware, for instance, where there's just so much monolithic uh, uh, layers of uh, software running there that uh, are trying to even consider decomposing them or like trying to put that into like a service perspective, SOA perspective may not necessarily make sense right away. Instead, if you're trying to build uh, new apps or new services, uh, those probably are better candidates for uh, uh, considering containers as a target. Uh, I do, however, want to come back to your original question about uh, whether or not OpenStack matters. So not just DirectTV, while working with EMC and Cisco, I worked with many Fortune 500 companies uh, building and architecting solutions for them, where every company will have to travel that trajectory, that journey, where they are being introduced to from a legacy environment, virtualization environment to an OpenStack kind of environment, they are not going to necessarily be able to leapfrog uh, always. They'll be uh, outliers, but they may not necessarily be able to leapfrog uh, directly to containerized uh, world uh, by passing the API-friendly OpenStack ecosystem. Questions? Anybody? Can, can I ask a question? No. Uh, yes. Go ahead. I, I think there's this mis there's this like perception also in the industry that like some apps can't be containerized. I don't agree with that. I think that there are certain classes of apps that that are harder to containerize. Um, also, you don't uh, you don't necessarily have to run them in a container. They can run on bare metal if you're running like NFE or some other kernel components. But um, I, I don't get it. Like yeah. MySQL runs in a container, no problem. Postgres runs in a container, no problem. Oracle runs in a container, no problem. Like, I think that there's this like, mindset that people say, well, my app can't be containerized. I, I don't really buy it when it comes down to it. Yeah, I, you know, everything can be containerized, there's no doubt. It doesn't make business sense and risk if it's your, your crown jewels to go and pick up infrastructure that's been running and running platforms that you rely on that you're, you're making business decisions on picking them up, that's a, that's a big risk factor, right? So, you know, even our journey to VMs, right, we didn't go and say, let's just pick up data stores that we've relied on for, th for 15 years in business and just put them in VMs day one. We've said, let's be pragmatic, let's take, let's take things slowly and, and move things in and see how it goes, right? And then as that evolves, you, I know you can, you, absolutely you can run MySQL, but to do that day one, it's just a, a big pill to swallow for the business. So business risks, you know. I, I'm going to go further. I'm going to say it's actually easier to run some of these legacy apps in a container. And, and here's why. The, my use case when I was first, on my first startup was I was orchestrating Puppet in 2006 when nobody had heard of it. <laughs> and we would like spin up an Oracle database and we would run the command to create an empty database. 30 minutes later, I had an empty database. 
<laughs> unlike with MySQL where it takes like half a second. And like if I had already created that empty database in a container and I can just replicate that out, I just save 30, I mean, an extra 30 minutes in the provisioning time to scale out, I mean, that's unacceptable, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so I, I don't it's, know. It's tooling and knowledge and, and the people that have, that have run it, right? I don't think anybody's gonna, going to not want to go to it, but it's just, you know, it's the journey. And even the front-end applications that we've moved, you know, and I'm sure it was the same with Siri. It's like, how the heck do we debug this in prod? Uh, how do we get the tooling around? It wasn't like all the tooling was there day one and you went, you know, cut the, cut the, the red tape. Siri's done, we can all go home, don't need to touch her again, she's an organism living and breathing. When you actually get in the trenches, you're like, what is a, a C group actually doing when I ask it for this much, and, and how does that look? And what's noisy neighbor look like in a container? What do all these things that I've actually solved with virtualization look like? And that is the journey that we're on now, right? Actually building tooling around containerizing. So that's probably why it takes it's a largest pill to swallow with something like your crown jewels, your data stores, right? Your, your system of record. This is what your business is actually dependent on. You can't throw it away or lose it. So, you know, risk-wise, moving something like that is, is just a, big, a pill that's too big to swallow right now for us. Okay, so wh what about like a containers only OpenStack? You know, I'm like spouting sacrilege here, but like imagine like no Nova, you know, maybe just Keystone. God forbid, maybe not even Neutron, you know, but just, you know, spin up containers and or Kubernetes and Mesos in harmony with Magnum, whatever, you know, just like really stripped down, you know, you can tell your developers, hey, just point and click, stick your, take your Docker image right off your laptop, shoot it into this thing, and, you know, you've got 100 copies, you know, instantaneously, like, I mean, does that make any sense? Is it, is the I think we call out? that Mesos already. <laughs> Don't we? Uh, Mesos would be a little bit different, right? I mean, it's got a whole scheduling system and a level of sophistication that OpenStack by comparison is not. Um, There's no orchestration right? <laughs> necessarily, right? Yeah. Uh, absolutely, I think there's, there's room for it. And again, it comes around tooling and the journey, right? So you've got all these APIs that you've built tooling around. You've got Cinder, you've got Neutron, whether it makes sense to use these down the track, but in your journey, as you start going down, Rebuilding everything from scratch is sometimes too hard. I mean, some, in some cases it does make sense where you've got greenfield. Maybe just uh, you don't do a Mises. You know, the thing is, like, we talk about, like, this pets versus cattle thing, right? Yeah. And, and, like, in OpenStack, like, you, when you put a new cattle on the line, it's like you take it out and then you, like, you know, you clean it all and you curry it and you feed it and you maybe put a little, you know, hat on it and, like, you know, everything's very precious Are you the dressing whole your cattle now? Is that what we're doing? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what it's like, right? It's like I spin up the VM and then I attach a box store to it and I put it on this VPC and the network has to be, there's two network interfaces and it's pretty elaborate, right? In, but, like, in container land, I'm guessing that Siri doesn't have, like, multiple network interfaces per like container and you know that it's just a lot more stripped down because I mean Google's not doing that with their container based system. Absolutely you know I get a lot of questions around the production environment right what's the IP address of the container I said forget about it right you're attaching it behind right. a load balancer just for this everything's ephemeral right the, the you don't even care about the IP about address of stuff. a container right yeah. it just doesn't matter everything's by name forget about IPs right uh, uh, but it's just again it's a journey and people, uh, uh, you need to break the way people think and, and, and help them, you know, handhold and move them on. I think like a, an all container open stack would be cool. I mean, I think that there's a tremendous amount of complexity that gets removed out of that, that kind of stack, right? And I'm all about making it simple. At a certain scale, it's gotta be simple. So I think that if you could remove all this, uh, I mean, you look at uh, you look at all the vendors on the show floor, and we're, we have our own, you know, um, reference architecture for OpenStack. There's UmpDM VLANs, and there's all this complexity, and you you got to attach the store here, and there's two network ports. It's just it's just crazy. There's just so much complexity in that system that anything you can do to drive out all of that, I think you'll be better off longer term, even at a small scale. I don't know, man. I, 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 it seems like most IT engineers prefer complexity. They, they, that's the way they solve problems is adding another piece. Another layer of abstraction, right? Ugh. Anyway, um, so I would really like somebody to come up and ask these three smart guys questions. You have the person who built the infrastructure under Siri here, and 
you don't, you don't, there's no hankering in your heart to learn something about that. He might not tell you, but you could give it a go. <laughs> I can call on people. Don't embarrass people, Randy. Don't, uh, that ship has sailed. Anybody? Oh my God, we must be terribly boring. Okay, um, well, I'll keep going. I don't mind talking, you know me. Um, so, I, thank you, you win Come a prize. I don't know what it is, but Nicole right here is gonna help you out later on. Hi. Go ahead. You've won a so, pony. So, I mean, I see a lot of uh, you folks who are managing these clouds and driving the fact let's move towards containers. Is the push strongly coming from the app side, app developers, or, you know, is there a lot of momentum on that side, or are they kind of too busy doing their day job and really don't know? I mean, uh, you know, especially Lithium or Siri yeah. was the push that let's use our infrastructure at higher utilization. So let's make the effort, and then the app guys will push them. So I just want to understand which side of the game, and you know, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, at least in my experience, it wasn't the app guys that that wanted to go down that route. Um, it was, really, it was really us as the operations team. I think that, that different organizations, you'll get the pressure from, from either the apps or the ops team, um, depending upon what the pain point is. I think in most organizations, the IT infrastructure is lacking, and so the developers try to take more and more of that responsibility on their shoulders, because when the app breaks in production, they get the phone call. Um, so I, I think that, um, that when you hear about application developers wanting containers and wanting this sort of things, it's because the underlying infrastructure has been so insufficient that they want to take on that responsibility on themselves, and that their day job is you know features, not ops, um, and so they want the ops piece to be as simple as possible. But um, I think there's other organizations where um, you know the, the ops guys want to. I mean, I think if we're all IT ops people here, we all want to be successful. Uh, running infrastructure. So I think it comes from both places depending upon what the politics and what the dynamic is in the organization. Yeah, from our perspective, I, I don't think, and I think probably across the board, uh, developers couldn't care less whether it runs in a container or a VM, right? They just have a certain set of requirements and they need to get something out, right? They compute storage network and that's all they really care about. How it runs and what it runs on really isn't what they're necessarily concerned about, but you know, the, the promise we sold with the cloud was we were going to make self-service infrastructure easier, right? And when we actually queried our, our development team on, we'd actually obfuscated it so much that we've made it more complex. And it was almost easier to deploy to bare metal than it was using an orchestrated VM infrastructure, right? And, and we looked at that and said, you know, that's not the promise that we sold those guys. We actually said we were going to make it easier for you to deploy your apps, figure out what's going on, and stop worrying about the infrastructure, just start worrying about what you pay to do, which is write features and get features out into the environment. So, you know, we, we saw the lack there and we tried to actually help them uh, meet that need, which was stop worrying about the infrastructure and, and start worrying about writing features. So um, that's something they've come back to us and we're actually just getting, you know, I've got an email as long as my arm just saying, thank you, I can now start worrying about just writing features. So that's something we've achieved with containers, but I don't think necessarily they cared that it was containers. Docker just did a very good job of making it sexy to put things in containers, right? That's what for developers. For developers, right? That's the you know, something they've done a tremendous. They've made the experience to containerize things. It's not like they invented sexy. containers, right? I mean, no, I mean they, like they made for containers like eight sexy. Years. I was using <laughs> Solaris zones ten years ago yeah. in production, and you were jails. So in addition to some very interesting perspectives already shared, I think the, the need uh, come, arises from multiple uh, stakeholders, uh, maybe an architecture group and uh, the operational group. Uh, uh, the, the executive management wanting operational simplicity and agility on the development side when translated into uh, technology, container is a very good option to consider. And so uh, I, I, I kind of believe that it's not necessarily the application owners that are driving this, it's uh, multiple stakeholders. And the, you know, just one more thing, you know, the confluence of, of DevOps and microservices and all these things have kind of led to play into the, the, the field of containers, the sweet spot. Yeah. 
where you've kind of given developers access to the infrastructure. You've asked them, you've given them a, the pager they have to get out of bed. So actually making it easier for them to get, get things out and to fix things and deploy things is something they want and need. So. So as a follow on to that last question and this discussion, which I find really interesting. So IT ops side, I think all people in the room get it. So the dev side, you're rolling it out. Hey guys, you're gonna get containers come Monday. What do the developers need to do or understand or learn differently with say the Docker environment or what have you to be able to encapsulate the dependencies and all that? Is it a big learning curve? Is it easy? I, I don't think in my experience it's, it's it's a learning curve. I think that um, depending on how the infrastructure is set up to receive the, the container, um, the developers just declare what their runtime dependencies are. Ju they just declare them differently than they did in the past. So for example, if I'm a, running a, writing a Java application, I would email my ops guy or put in a ticket that's saying, hey, I need Java 1.7, right? So they make this declaration about what they need and they expect it to be in place. Whereas with containers, they can declare that requirement themselves for themselves, and they can trust that the, the infrastructure will honor that declaration. So the learning curve is, you know, instead of filing and that's a ticket. That's because the app is packaged up with all those dependencies. Yeah, that's it's right. Got Java 1.7 plus the app plus the library. Plus whatever else you want. Plus you want, um, I don't know what else you'd want with a Java app, but um, it's, it's, the learning curve is basically instead of declaring it through a ticket or through an email or through a document that you, you give to the ops guy, you declare it in your Docker file, right? So there's maybe a, a little bit of a learning curve, a syntax learning curve, but I think it's something that but most developers should But the fear, the fear of all with. operators is when you give the developers that power, they'll do they'll put crazy stuff in there that maybe increases your attack surface or you know isn't the monitoring standard that you picked or whatever. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, it, I think it's better than giving a developer a credit card, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I think the most dangerous thing you have is you have all these developers running around with P cards and credit cards that are going out on Amazon and doing whatever, right? Um, I, I think that's more dangerous. I mean, you can, you can allow them to declare from a set of curated packages, for an example, to deal with those types of things. Um, so it's not totally the Wild West. Go ahead, yeah, I, I mean, we've, we've actually found it to be they want to be more compliant, right? Because we can provide these containers cut with Java 1.7 in them that are based off our security best practices. And they can just basically, all they need to say is from lithium Java 1.7, add my jar, right? And run my jar. And they're like, this looks like a, a bash script, a shell script, right? And that's what they're expecting. They're not expecting a, a chef recipe and a run book and a puppet manifest, right? Which is a, a big, massive overhead for them to deploy an app. Um, but one of you, to, to go back to the original question, which was... Um, we have to wrap up soon. Just wrap, now. okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll finish. You talk more than Randy, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a contest on that later. Um, I, normally, I would try to summarize what we talked about, and I, I feel that that's a little bit hard in this case, right? And the reason I think it's a little bit hard is it's clear that depending on whether you're a web scale or a startup or a classic enterprise, Maybe your, your needs are very just enough that like containers are either like a really awesome fit or not, you know, only do a little bit for you. Um, but the things I thought that we agreed on is that it makes the developer's life a lot easier and a lot of the time maybe makes even the operator's life a lot easier. Um, so there's some clear wins. So maybe it's like OpenStack sometimes and Meso sometimes now. But, you know, I've always had the belief that kind of all businesses at some point have to move towards being more web scale like. Maybe I'm wrong about it, but, you know, if you watch me, you know, I, I, I promulgate that notion. So in that case, maybe it's like it's uh, an ideal, an ideal goal, a platonic ideal that we would want to try to achieve, which is more pure play containers and then what do you think? I'll give you your last 30 seconds. That's a very uh, tempting future where you have that open stack, maybe even bare metal, ironic, uh, provisioning uh, and so bare metal containers uh, coexisting in that ecosystem and I, I we definitely as that uh, maturity arrives even classic enterprises will have to consider it as a very compelling uh, way of solving certain technology problems so there's definitely very uh, interesting future pipeline there lucky yeah, I mean I mean for us it's 30 the, seconds the, the, the clear <laughs> the value prop for us is that you can take that container image and run it the same way whether it's bare metal on a VM in AWS. Just That's don't it. care. 
Just right. don't care. I, I think my closing message is whatever you do, keep it as simple as possible, especially at scale. Love it. All right. Thank, thank you very thank much, you the panel. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Randy.